taking some of the media, I guess, depictions of you know, the, the, the 30th anniversary, and of course I came across a, uh, Lord Tebbett's quotes and thoughts about, about you. In, in one interview he recently said, this is from BBC a couple of days ago, talking about Pat McGee, he said, he has never repented for his sins, and without repentance there can be no forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, when you hear that thought from Norman Tebbett, what do you think or feel or, in a way, if he was in this room, how would you respond? How could I possibly repent? How could I possibly seek forgiveness for something that, uh, in the past, when I made conscious decisions that were thought through and acted upon them? How can I ask for forgiveness for that when I, I still believe, despite what I said about the necessity of looking back and reappraising the past, and I'll do that. But my present understanding and going looking back in those early days of the conflict was that we had no other choice. So how can I repent for that? How can I seek forgiveness for that? There's a flip side of that is though that uh, I, I feel very conflicted coming out of that conflict and understanding the pain and the hurt that was caused. It's this obligation, I think, um, to try and do something about that. But I think it's a different thing. It feels different to me. And it's been an incredible journey the last uh, 14 years. And I've been learning. Every time we meet, I learn more about myself. And it isn't that we've reached a point where everything's always OK. It's ongoing learning and trans transformational. And I've still got that part of me that, when I'm hurting, still wants to blame and judge. And it's about catching that and choosing a different response. But I'm always working on my antennae and my self-awareness to make sure that I choose that empathic response. But there have been times when I have blamed Patrick and have been angry. So I'm always, I'm always learning. And, and right now I'm just feeling so full of just gratitude that Patrick still got the courage to meet me, that he came to Brighton yesterday. It was difficult. And we had this most extraordinary day and that our example led to these amazing young people saying that their lives had been changed with the workshop they went to. And when I think back to the May 27, 30 years ago, wanting to bring something positive, you know, we have done that and there's always more to do. Each time we met, we went deeper into talking about difficult areas and, and listening. I remember once we were at Glen Cree Reconciliation Centre and we were filming and when the cameras stopped filming, we talked late into the night, just the two of us. And I reached a point about two in the morning where I heard things that touched me deeply, that shook me, of really knowing that if I'd, if I'd lived Pat's life, if I'd experienced everything he'd been through, gone through these experiences with the British Army, with his family, and some of the horrors he'd seen, what his community were feeling, would I? have made the same choices, I don't know. And in that moment, there wasn't anything to forgive. There was just that understanding and that empathy. And I had that experience later on with somebody who was in the, who'd been in the British Army and somebody who'd been in the lawless paramilitary. And then I realized, actually, there is no other. That when I really listen, when I open my heart and listen, when I suspend my judgment and my need to blame, then I discover there is no other just human beings who were connected with our humanity and our struggles, or doing what they can do. And I wonder how much was your experience in prison transformational? How did you respond to that loss of freedom and how many steps towards mm. meeting Joe had you taken as a result of mm. self-reflection during that time? One of the very first things you're, you're, you're told when you <coughs> express this desire to become involved is, uh, this is only going to go two ways, you know, you're going down a hole or you're going to jail and that's pretty much how it's panned out for everybody ever got involved. And for me, the jail was another front in our struggle. It just become, you know, suddenly you're in, the, you're held by the state, you're in the belly of the beast, as we would have talked about it. And uh, you're in struggle and uh, you feel connected. Another front in the struggle. You're in jail on this front of the struggle. The struggle outside continues and you're linked with it, you know. So it isn't as if you're removed from it and suddenly you've got this uh, space 
um, to for introspection, etc. It isn't like that. But of course, you do develop because it's just a natural thing that happens that you grow older and you look back and you try to learn you try to become better you educated yourself to make yourself a person better able to articulate your position etc something else I've, I've read about you saying is about that you don't tend to use the word forgiveness what is it what's your thought around that yeah well it's a really difficult word and <clears throat> when the documentary went out facing the enemy some people said to me oh it's such a such a pity joe that you can't forgive pat and some people said well well done for forgiving him <laughs> and they've seen the same film and that was that was the beginning of my concern about the word you know, interesting when i was 28 i could talk about forgiveness really easily so you know I, i'm always i might change again i'm not T attached to any any thoughts about forgiveness because I think I'm learning about it but the strongest experience I have is is this experience of of that empathy where actually there isn't anything to forgive and that to me it it brings in an equality and a connection and, and something which isn't about me saying I'm so mag I'm such a wonderful person I'm going to forgive you which I'm not so happy with that and you know the only person I can forgive is myself, and I, I quite often give myself a hard time. I do things to hurt people, and it's about me, I believe, forgiving myself, and Pat has his own relationship with it. I mean, often we hear about the idea of compassion fatigue or empathy fatigue, the idea that, well, you know, we, there's such a barrage of news stories about violence or images of violence on, on, on TV and war and so on that in the end a lot of us just switch off or how do you keep engaged in the suffering of other people? And sometimes it is important to go for the long walk and not in nature and not think about anything. Sometimes it's important to read a book and escape. But also there is something about the transformation of those feelings that means I'm never, I'm never going to have compassion fatigue. I'm never going to have it. Because there's a there's feeling the pain and that's transformed into my absolute passion and compassion for others and wish to work for peace and that's an inner process that happens all the time. So I something that I'm not concerned about. But I look off I learn I'm learning now to look after myself and to know when to say, That's enough. You know, I now need to look after myself. And I, I it's taken me a long time to learn about this, but it's absolutely essential. Another thought I had when I was listening to you was about whether the means justify the ends and whether your views have changed through time about, for example, the use of violence to achieve whether it's equality or freedom or liberation or whatever it happens to be in different circumstances. Do, does the means justify the ends or not? It is in itself a legacy issue that we should have be um, critical of our historic role. And even on an individual lesson, I do that. I look back and say to myself, it's an important thing for me to understand. For me, was there another way? I have to, uh, I have to remain open to the possibility that there was another way. And if I can see it, I'll shout it from the rooftops. Because nobody, no sane person would choose violence over other options when they're available. Yeah. As, as beleaguered communities, then in that heat, we didn't see them. I didn't see them. What I was a witness to uh, was uh, um, poor people in poor districts in conflict with the state. And after a lot of soul searching, I made a decision to join their struggle. I was a part of that and I joined that struggle. But I think it's important to go back as a, as a, a human exercise and reappraise our early motivations, reappraise the context. If we see the humanity of everyone in the world, we cannot have a foreign policy of using violence. You know, we cannot demonize people in prisons. We cannot punish people. We're going to be looking at restorative justice, looking at um, peace building skills in schools, developing university courses, and that's where I think we all need to go. And I'm hearing that wherever I am, 
And I'm right now dedicating my next 30 years, if, if I have them, I hope so, to developing this work. And I would love very much for Pat to carry on working with me. I, I, I'm just very moved by his courage and his willingness to carry on and the wisdom that he's sharing and his humbleness and humility and honesty. And I um, feel very grateful to him. As I've been listening to them, I've been thinking actually about my own life. Thinking about, I think, well, if, if Joe and Pat can talk to each other, well, what, who, where are the conversations in my own life that I'm not, what are the conversations that I'm not having? Whether it's a, with a sibling I haven't spoken to for years or, or other things like that. And I think there are a lot of things we can take away from this about politics and society, but also for the role of understanding other people's stories in our own lives and giving uh, opportunities and chances for them to be heard. So once again, thank you to Pat and to Joe. Thank you.